The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Merry meets and merry parts, bright the cheeks and warm the heart. So tread the circle thrice about to keep unwelcome spirits out. Bide within the law you must, in perfect love trust. Mind the threefold laws you should, three times bad and three times good. These eight words the read fulfill, and ye harm none to what ye will. Welcome to Stirring the Cauldron. Now, here's your host, Marla Brooks. Hey, Mary Meet, everybody. Now, you know, a lot of people have the thought that aliens landing on this planet wouldn't be a very good thing. But in his book, The Healing Power of UFOs, Preston Dennett shares true accounts of people that have been healed by the extraterrestrials. Now, Preston began investigating UFOs and the paranormal in around 1986 when he discovered that his family, friends, and co-workers were having dramatic and unexplained encounters. Since then, he's interviewed hundreds and hundreds of witnesses and investigated a wide variety of paranormal phenomena. He's also um, a field investigator for MUFON. Um, a ghost hunter, a paranormal researcher, and the author of 23 books and more than 100 articles on UFOs and the paranormal. He's appeared on numerous radio and television programs, including Coast to Coast and History Channel's Deep Sea UFOs and UFO Hunters. And his research has been presented in places like the LA Times, the LA Daily News, the Dallas Morning News, lots of other newspapers. And he's also taught classes on various paranormal subjects and lectures across the United States. Um, questions and comments are always welcome here in the Parax chat room. So if you're listening live, it's Thursday night and you want to join in, come over to paraxradionetwork.com and join the chat. All right. Welcome back, Preston. I can't even get that out. It's been a long time since you've been here. <laughs> Thanks, Marla. I'm happy to be back. Stirring the cauldron. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, you stir it up pretty good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the interesting thing about that is, you know, um, you have so many books to choose from. You know, it's really easy. It's some people are like a one-trick pony and only write about you know one thing, but your books are so different that it looks really good. Um, so let me let me say that the consensus um, is that extraterrestrials, like I kind of mentioned before, um, people think they're here to invade. But but you say that they're here not to invade or to save us, but they want to study us, and that's in many ways kind of seems like they're well, they're kind of more advanced than we are, especially in technology, and. We could probably learn a lot from them, but what do you think they learned from us? Oh, well, that's actually a pretty good question because I think they are very advanced. Mm -hmm. Honestly, and that we have a lot more to learn from them than they do from us. I don't think there's any real good evidence that they're here to invade. And I think while perhaps in the beginning that was sort of a concern of a lot of investigators, I think the, mo the majority of investigators have come to realize that, no, that's not their purpose. They're not here to harm or hurt or study or experiment. They're here to guide, teach, heal, awaken, warn. Those are, I think, honestly, their main agendas. And I think it's backed up by the actual case studies. So I'm not so sure that they have so much to learn from us as we have to learn from them. Well, you know, you hear um, for years that they have been down here. They have been teaching. Um, people in the government or high places have made treaties with them or, or, you know, deals with them. What do you think? Is that true in your mind? 
No, I know exactly what you're talking about. I tried to trace this to its source, and I honestly think that's probably disinformation, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. It's often called the Granada Treaty. I couldn't find any good reporting on it. I really couldn't. What I do think did happen was a meeting in 1954, I believe it was, at Edwards Air Force Base. It's quite well known in the UFO community where ETs landed at Edwards Air Force Base in Southern California and met with Eisenhower and other leaders of state and religion and politics and business and science and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a whole meeting where we were encouraged to stop our nuclear program because it was damaging to ourselves and others that we weren't even aware of. Mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't want to do that. And they encouraged us to disclose. And that was another thing that our military leaders, unfortunately, <laughs> didn't want to do. And I think there was a little bit of an impasse. And that was the ET's last real attempt to work directly with our government leaders. Because if you look into it, there are a number of reports like this. But no, as far as, I mean, ETs are not going to hand over super advanced technology when we have a very long and heinous, I love that word, heinous, <laughs> you know, record yeah. of abusing it. Mm -hmm. This is why they don't come down and just hand over healing technology. Because there's just no way that that would be used in the correct way. Well, also, though, would they understand, I mean, think that we could understand that stuff that might be way up above our heads? Yeah, for sure. I don't think we could. In fact, it's pretty clear, judging just from the huge number of whistleblower accounts, government insiders, that we do have these craft. We have bodies. We have ET technology. And I think it has been reverse engineered to a certain degree, but very limited. We mm. simply do not have the ability to, you know, haven't made any craft like these guys, the ETs, <laughs> what they well, can do. Probably they've been around a lot longer than we have because, you know, you talk back uh, to ancient Egypt and they said that they helped, you know, build the pyramids and in Stonehenge they helped there. And, you know, so they, they almost came well, maybe the same time mankind, because that's the only time we knew it. But maybe they've been around even longer than that. I think so. Probably before recorded history, because the glimmerings of history that we have, going all the way back to you know, Native American traditions, oral traditions, they go way back. And they certainly talk about contact. Um, ancient writings of India, the Vimyanas and the Ved Vedic uh Writings talk about UFOs, like you said, hieroglyphs, mm -hmm. stone carvings. I mean, you name it, wherever you look in ancient history, even all through history up in the Roman times, they had UFOs. Mm -hmm. They called them flying shields. We have <laughs> history of this. They kind of looked at it. This is a problem with the UFO field. People look at it through the lens of their belief, their mm -hmm. cultural perspective. Romans right. had no idea what they were looking at and called them, well, they look like shields. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we see them in Renaissance times and paintings yeah. and Middle Age wood carvings. Yeah, I'm sure that they've been here for longer than we have. Yeah. Well, I've got to say that this is a big book of yours. Um, 500 plus pages, 28 chapters, 300 accounts of people being healed by extraterrestrials. And um, we know that each experience isn't the same, but overall, um, there are three typical scenarios of UFO healing. And, and you want to uh, elaborate a little bit on that? How, how yeah, they, yeah, yeah, this is a bit of a simplification. Yeah. But I think what we're looking at is people may be driving outside or walking outside, and a UFO comes down and perhaps shines a beam of light or hovers over their head, circles around them, gets close to them in some way, and enacts a healing. Sometimes, I mean, there are cases where people just in the presence of a UFO <laughs> experience an actual healing. Mm. Uh, I would say more often people have what amounts to a house visit. I wish doctors still did that, but the <laughs> ETs do. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yeah, they'll come right into your bedroom and heal. I've got some amazing cases of that, or your home, or what have you. And I would say probably most common is people actually being taken on board, you know, basically into what we would think of as a doctor's office and laid out on a table or often a chair, like a dentist chair, really. Mm -hmm. That's where they do the healing. It's almost always done. Well, I won't say always, but the majority of cases use some form of light, some sort of what we would call light therapy. Mm -hmm. Not very interesting. But yeah, those are the three basic scenarios. But I will say, and this so surprised me, Marla, when I found this out, 10% mm. about of the cases take place in, get this, a hospital room. I was just going to say that because it, it's really interesting that they sneak in when nobody's around and they probably dress up like doctors or I don't know what. But, you know, what, what a better place to show up in, huh? Yeah, I mean, it kind of makes sense. And if you know this field, as any researcher will tell you, they can't appear anywhere. I mean, I've got cases of people in crowded condominium complexes, hotel rooms, very dense suburbs, driving on the freeway at rush hour. I mean, you name it, they can show up. But yeah, I mean, one amazing hospital case, which I, I, I love because it kind of points to who gets healed and why. Mm, talk um, about it. Talk about it. Yeah, this is from England, actually. Fred White from Durham, England, had a sighting some years earlier, didn't think much of it. But as he got older, he developed a medical condition where he had difficulty breathing and pain in his chest and was diagnosed with a hole in his heart, mm. apparently congenital. And they said, well, you need to do an operation. This is not something that can be left alone. And he agreed. And it was the day before surgery. And I find this so interesting because this happens so often. I call it the last minute syndrome <laughs> because right before someone goes into surgery, this is when often there'll be an intervention. Mm -hmm. And he's just laying there in bed struggling to breathe and uh, dealing with the pain. This, is, this was already imaged, mind you, his condition in terms of MRIs and x-rays and so forth. Mm -hmm. But he's laying there in bed when in walks this doctor. And he's like, wow, this is a strange looking doctor because his clothes aren't your, the normal white coat, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of robe like or it may have been a jumpsuit, but I believe it was more of a robe. Uh, very exotic looking eyes. Just a kind of a strange looking fella. And was wearing what looked like a watch. This caught Fred White's attention because there was no clock face on it. It was just this glowing thing. Mm. And uh, this guy, this figure, walks in and says, we are going to heal you. Uh, and he's still thinking it's a doctor, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this guy says, we're, we're, we're very interested in your work in electronics. Fred White was an electronics expert and inventor, actually, mm -hmm. and was working on his little projects. And this figure that walks in starts to pass his hand with the watch-like instrument over Fred's chest, over his torso, several times back and forth. Eh, not for long, five minutes less. And suddenly Fred felt the pain go away, and he could start to breathe deeply and easily. And he was amazed, and this guy just walks out through the front door, and in walk the other physicians, and they're like, okay, we're ready for surgery. And Fred's like, no, wait, I want more x-rays. I'm feeling much better. <laughs> mm -hmm. They're like, no, 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 we already did them. He says, I'm not agreeing to surgery until you do more x-rays. Which, of course, they agreed. Mm -hmm. and they found out the hole in his heart was gone. So that's one of like, gosh, I don't know, 20 heart healings, heart alone. Wow. They touch every part of the human body. Every condition you can imagine, almost. Well, yeah, and you know, um, I was when I was reading that um, somebody that you know, but I'm not going to mention her name, um, got strangely healed. Um, she had two bouts of cancer. Um, she had, you know, the, ke the chemo on the first time, radio radiology on the other, radiogram, whatever. 
um, the second time, you know, and so she had to keep going in for, you know, six months, every six months to do a PET scan and, you know, just check that things are uh, not uh, getting worse or whatever. And the last time, this was very recently, so maybe you don't know this, but um, a few months ago, she went in for her regular routine case and they did whatever they had to do. And um, the doctor said, I don't understand this at all. There's no evidence that you ever had cancer, ever. I mean, he was totally flabbergasted that there was no sign to begin with. And she's someone that talks about um, extraterrestrials and stuff. And um, so I was reading that and it reminded me of her. And I thought, hmm. You know that's kind of that's kind of interesting that that they're healing. So, I mean, is there? Um, I mean, why do they want to come and heal us? I mean, how do they choose who needs it or or what? Does it like with that Fred? Um, it was because they needed some information from him about electronics or something. Is that how they judge who they're going to heal? Um, well, that was one of the first clues because I started looking into this early on. You know, this is something I started researching for when I first got into the UFO field back in 1986. Mm-hmm. Case of a lady who was healed of a cyst. And then I thought, you know, this would make a good article because I knew of a, you know, the Jacques Vallée case where a doctor in France was healed of a cut on his ankle and partial paralysis. I knew of a case involving a Peruvian customs official who was healed of rheumatism and <laughs> nearsightedness of all things. Uh, but yeah, I knew of several cases, one in Damon, Texas, where a police officer was healed of a cut, or actually a wound on his finger from a baby pet alligator. I thought this would make a good article. And it ended up being a book because I found like 30 cases in two weeks. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, I'm like, okay, let's dig deeper. And uh, I had 100 cases initially, and it still wasn't enough for me to really f- figure out who's being healed and why. It was evenly divided between mm-hmm. men and women. Now that I've got like 300 cases, the database is pretty big. Mm-hmm. And it's still evenly divided between men and women. It's not age. I've got tiny little babies being healed. Cases oh. of this. And really old people, which is so touching. Mm-hmm. I mean, people of all ages, it's all over the planet. It's not geographical. It's not blood type or ancestry, because I can tell you people of every ancestry have been healed. So I'm mm-hmm. struggling here. I'm like, political affiliations? No. <laughs> I started asking people, you know, like, are you a Republican? Are you a Democrat? I mean, I'm yeah. searching. <laughs> <laughs> and what I found were a couple of main patterns. Okay. One is that, do you have a history of UFO encounters? Mm-hmm. And I would say over 50% of people who've been healed do. This is something they experience regularly. They've been taken on board. They have parents or grandparents or aunts and uncles or or their children. Mm -hmm. So there are, I guess, genetic lines that ETs are particularly interested in because there's something perhaps special about them. Mm -hmm. I think it's because they're very psychic uh, and they like to encourage that. That's one of their agendas, I should say, one of their goals. Yeah. But then here's the case that actually... Figured it, I figured it out because I mm. <laughs> this lady from Norway contacts me. She's like, oh, I heard about your research into healings. This is awesome. I want to share my case. And I'm like, of course, please do. She says, please don't use my name. <laughs> here's, here's what happened to me. And she described how she, in long story short, had Grays come into her room, flip her around like a rag doll, she says. Mm. There's three, three Grays, and she's kind of screaming at them, who are you? What are you doing? What's going on? And they did not communicate, or she didn't perceive it, mm-hmm. perhaps because she was in great fear, uh-huh. which, which can block that. So she's freaking out, right? <laughs> As they're flipping her on her back, or on her <laughs> stomach, actually, and put this thing on her back. It's an instrument I've heard described. It's cylindrical with a little handle. And she felt energy pulse through her, electrical kind of. Mm-hmm. And it was all very quick. I mean, this was three minutes tops. And mm-hmm. how they go through the door or through the uh, wall <laughs> like they do? And she jumps up and runs to the window, and her yard is filled with this eerie blue light, which 
winks out. Mm. And she's like, wow, what the heck just happened? And she noticed immediately that her back was no longer painful. She had suffered a serious back injury. Mm. And it was chronic. I mean, she had real bad pain. Uh, the doctors couldn't help her. It actually forced her to retire. And I asked her, well, what are you, you know, I asked her first, do you have a history of encounters? She denied it. <laughs> She's like, no. And I dug deep because sometimes people will say, oh, no, no. And then I'm like, well, did anything weird happen when you were a kid? Mm-hmm. Say, well, actually, yeah, I did have figures coming into my room. I'm like, well, there you go. <laughs> But she, she said, no, no, this is a one-off. This has never happened to me before or since. I'm like, huh. So I asked her every question I could think of, and finally I get to her job. I'm like, what do you do for a living? And she said, well, I'm retired. You know, I was an artist. But now, and this is when she said, please don't use my name because I'm pretty well-known. Mm-hmm. I am well-known in my community for doing animal rights and human rights. And when she said that, bells went off in my head. Mm. Yeah, I had just interviewed Reverend Michael Carter, who is a healer, you know, a reverend, uh, works against racism. He's African-American. He was actually given a medal by President Clinton for his outstanding work in you know, fighting discrimination. Mm-hmm. And he told me this amazing healing <laughs> incident that he had where a, a human-looking E.T. came into his room and healed him of a blood clot in his leg. Mm. Yeah, his leg was like three times the normal size. Ouch. And uh, the doctor freaked out when he finally came, went and was like, you could be dead right now. Why did you wait so long? We have to put you on blood thinners. There's a whole cocktail. We have to watch you very closely. This is serious. Mm-hmm. And he goes back to the doctor and says, look, my, look at my leg. The doctor completely freaked out, as they always <laughs> do. But, yeah, I'm getting off on a tangent. He's, mm. you know, fighting against racism. And I thought, well, gosh, that's just like John Hunter Gray, one of my favorite cases. Mm-hmm. He was healed. And I just started going down the list. I'm like, well, Jacques Vallée's case, he's a doctor. Joe Burks had a case involving another doctor. A lot of doctors, a lot of teachers, inventors, police officers, musicians, uh, nurses, people who are doing good work for humanity in some capacity mm-hmm. is a really prominent pattern. Doesn't yeah. explain all of it, but like this, I hear it all the time. Well, they're keeping the people that are doing good work healthy. That's that makes sense. Yeah, which <laughs> is why I don't believe the false narrative of the ET threat. It's just not true. Hmm. Is there, um, okay, because, you know, people say the grays are bad and there's other benevolent ones and whatever, but is there a specific race of alien healers that do such good deeds like that? Um, Or is, like, every race have their good, their bad, and their healers and their non-healers? Well, I'm really glad you asked that because I certainly looked into it. I I think one thing that we need to start looking at a little bit differently is they're not that different from us. They're humanoids. They're basically human. This is what a lot of people have been told. Grays, strange humanoids of any kind, tall whites, you know, you can label them by their appearance. We have a tendency to do that here on Earth. (laughs) And it's not true. We're all one race. And this is what the ETs are telling people. We are you. You are us. We are one. I heard it from a dozen contactees. Mm-hmm. So people who don't aren't overwhelmed with fear will get these messages. So what I did find is most of the healings are being done by grays, what we would think of as grays. That surprised me because, as you said, people... They got a bad rap, rap. yeah. <laughs> they do. It's not, it's not justified. It's not. Because I thought, oh, it's going to be all human-looking, you know, the friendly ETs. The Palladians or something. <laughs> right. Yeah. But no, no, they're by all different types. Mm -hmm. They're little blue beings, what we'd think of as light beings or tall whites or, I mean, you name it. It's crazy. Absolutely unique looking or described, I should say, humanoids. But Mm -hmm. I really think we're, our relationship to them is much closer than we realize. Mm -hmm. They're not, I don't like the term alien even. They're people. 
Yeah. Well, they really are. Yeah. yeah. Well, for well, lack of better description, I mean, you can say extraterrestrials, um, but some people get tongue-tied trying to say that. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, and and also um, these healings events—they're not rare, are they? I mean, you know, we don't hear about it every day. You have tons of of, of stories about that and talk to people, so they aren't as um, rare as we think they are, huh? Exactly. I initially did think, well, this is almost never happens. <laughs> but I think part of the problem was when I started researching this, this is a fringe subject, UFOs. Yeah. And U- UFO healings are the fringe of the fringe. Mm-hmm. It's quite frustrating when I'd find an account and realize, well, this is wasn't covered at all in any depth. It wasn't investigated. It was given brief mention. And I, you know, as time goes on, I started to get a lot better coverage of this I mean, from other researchers. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I thought it was rare, but I kept getting more cases myself. Yeah. This was turning up in, you know, 20, 30, 40% of the people I've interviewed. And I'm thinking it's probably more than that because a lot of people might not know. They have a lot of fear or missing time and perhaps don't quite connect the dots when suddenly they're feeling a lot better. (laughs) But Mm -hmm. there have been studies. The MUFON transcription study found that of about 10% of the cases showed a healing. But Edith Fiore, the first person with a PhD to write a book on onboard experiences, said half, 50%. And I thought that was interesting because there was a big study by the free organization fairly recently, headed in part by Ray Hernandez. And I was part of that uh, study, the analysis of it, at least. They found Mm -hmm. 50%. Uh, So I'm going to say it's, yeah, definitely more common, an absolute consistent feature. Most are not recorded or documented. Mm-hmm. But here's here's why I think it's so common, is because I started surveying all the major researchers, because certainly John Mack had several cases of people healed of cancer and uh, pneumonia and, I mean, a bunch of other stuff. Mm-hmm. So did David Jacobs, who takes kind of a dim view of the contact experience, still had cases of someone healed of diphtheria and, and the flu and other... And I cornered Bud Hopkins because he's kind of a leader in the onboard experience mm-hmm. subject. Uh, and he never wrote about it. In, well, he had seven or eight books, not one mention of it. So I cornered him at a convention. I'm like, Bud, <laughs> got a question for you. Do you have healing cases? And he says, oh, mm-hmm. yes, I sure do. And I'm quite encouraged by them. Cause mm-hmm. I'm like, great. And he gave his little statement on it. And that's when I started really digging deeper because Jacques Vallée has cases, as I mentioned, Philip Mantle, Timothy Good, English researchers, Michael Hesseman, a German researcher, Edith Fiore, Barbara Lamb has a bunch, one of my favorite researchers, Artie Sixkiller Clark, love her work. She has a bunch of cases. Yvonne Smith, Timothy Beckley, Brad Steiger. I mean, I could go down the list. Most major researchers have these cases. So, wow. Yeah, it's common. That's amazing. Um, we've got to take a quick break in a second, but I just want to mention that, you know, as I was skimming over the table of contents before I got deep into the book, um, it looks like in our medical profession, um, the way we have specialists and everything, they do the same thing. I mean, they have, you know, offices, they have specialists for hearts or, you know, orthopedics or stuff. I mean, it, it really is kind of, and you were saying, they're not very different than us, and it seems like their medical practice is the same as ours. In some respects, yeah. yeah. Some yeah. of the things they do, they heal people in many of the ways that we do. Mm-hmm. That includes hands-on healing, by the way, what we would think of as psychic healing. <laughs> some mm-hmm. cases do involve that, but or yeah, like they Reiki. use a, yeah. a lot of light, actually, more mm. than well, let, let's take a break because we've got so much to talk about, and um, you know, this first <laughs> first went the first half hour went like psh, like that. 
So let's take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to be talking more about um, the book, what's in it, um, some more true accounts by healings, and um, a whole lot more. And we've got a couple of questions from the chat room as well. So don't wander off, and we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Cauldron will be right back, so don't go away. If you end up with webbed feet, remember, you've been warned. You've been warned. Hi, I'm Kimberly Juarez with Cat Paranormal of Minnesota. And I'm Jerry Ayers with Supernatural Investigators of Minnesota. And together, we are The Calling. Every Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time and 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, only on ParaXRadioNetwork.com. For a truly unique podcast experience, we have you covered. Spirit by You with C.J. Dunham airs live from the Third Coast in Southeast Texas on Tuesday and Fridays at midnight Eastern Time, covering Creole folklore and folk magic to strange paranormal activity to new equipment for the field. C.J. Dunham is a Catholic swamp witch, a devotee to our Mother Mary in the Trinity, a true believer in our Lord the Holy Ghost, and Christ. Peace be with your spirit and the spirits by you. Hey everyone, it's Marla. If you like tonight's episode of Stirring the Cauldron and the archive podcast as well, take a look at the show's YouTube channel and check out the dozens of shows that are there just waiting to be heard. New shows are added each week, And while you're there, why not subscribe? It's free. And if you click on that tiny little bell icon at the top of the page, you'll be notified when new shows are available. Just go to YouTube.com and then type in Stirring the Cauldron Pair X and the link will appear. Just like magic. Welcome back to Stirring the Cauldron. Once again, here's your host, Marla Brooks. My guest tonight is Preston Dennett, and we're talking about his book, The Healing Powers of UFOs. And as I mentioned before the break, we're going to tell some more accounts. Um, There's a couple that I'm interested in hearing. And I got a question from the chat room that's kind of interesting, very interesting. Um, It says... um, where is it? Right in front of me. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> do you think that these healings could be a divine gift and these extraterrestrials could in fact be angels, maybe some of them? Um, that's a good question. I'm going to say yeah. no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as we would think of angels today in the classic religious doctrine. Uh I've looked into, you know, the whole paranormal field. Yeah. So, you know, ghosts, angels, demons, out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, levitation, psychic powers, all of it. And I, I found some of the literature on angels to be fairly compelling. Mm-hmm. I think there's probably something to that. And by angels, I mean uh, spiritual beings who are not human, haven't been human, or even what we would think of as third-dimensional Mm-hmm. Right? And there are people, God bless them, who feel that ETs are demonic, which mm-hmm. I also don't think is true. Mm-hmm. Because I've looked into that and I've studied some real hairy hauntings involving what I believe are probably demonic. Uh-huh. So there are accounts of angelic healings. And I included a chapter on some alternative healings that come from what I think might be what we would think of as angels. Mm-hmm. However, it's clear to me that this is a phenomenon that is viewed, as I mentioned earlier, through the lens of your culture. 
Right. If you go back in time, I'm pretty certain some of what people thought were angels were probably ETs. And I can speak to that directly from first-hand cases. Mm -hmm. It is a lady I interviewed in Maine is where she lives. She was originally, I think, in Georgia. But she's had lifelong contact with Grays and had a hybrid baby. She's met him several times. She's been healed at least twice, I think closer to three or four times. Uh, but one on one occasion, she was healed of a mass in her lung. The doctors were going to remove half of her lung. Mm-hmm. ETs came down and healed her. Another time, they healed her of a heart condition. And another time, I think it was of a, a flu, a serious case of the flu. Mm-hmm. At any rate, she had her visitation once with her hybrid son, which was one of her really clear contacts because she got kind of past the fear and the missing time that plagued so many people. Mm-hmm. And uh, they told her all kinds of information. Oh, gosh, Marla, it's so interesting. If I could run down just a real quick list of what they mm-hmm. told her. <gasps> sure. Because it's just fascinating. They said, uh-huh. you need to stop people. You need to tell people to stop putting out the greed and corruption they're putting out because you're on the pathway to destroying your society. They told her that if people should start disappearing from this planet, it's being done by us for the universal good. They mm. told her that they have been working with us for thousands of years and animals. They actually told her they upgraded the genetics of dogs and cats to help to boost their emotional intelligence so they could communicate better with humans. Just weird stuff like this. They warned her mm-hmm. about upcoming hurricanes and earthquakes and stuff like this. This was around the time of Just Katrina, Hurricane Katrina had just happened. Mm. And then they said, who you thought were angels was us. That was Mm. us. So, yeah, I think, you know, Jacques Vallée did a whole bunch of work on the commonalities between some angelic encounters or what we think are angelic encounters and UFO. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think we perceived it that way. But I honestly think that there probably are angelic beings. But these aren't them. (laughs) Right. They're just because when you have a glowing being walk into your room and say you're very religious, how are you going to perceive it? Well, yeah, that has got to be that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, You know, of all the people you've interviewed and written about, um, aside from being cured, are there any negative after effects from the healing that you're aware of? Um, not so much. I would say there is some emotional trauma, certainly, from some of the witnesses. While the vast majority do feel grateful and be like, wow, you know, I was healed. Mm -hmm. They saved my daughter's life of a tumor. I'm forever grateful. I mean, I put a chapter on there of people rescued from certain disaster, whether Mm -hmm. drowning or car accidents or storms or assault. Uh, So there's a lot of life-saving going on here Mm -hmm. there are people who feel violated Mm -hmm. i mean there was a lady from puerto rico who had pretty much terminal cancer who was healed by grays and she doesn't like the fact that they just came into her house (laughs) and (laughs) healed her and she says she's grateful for the healings but she's scared of them Mm -hmm. so they're I would say there is some emotional trauma with this. But get this, I have four cases of people healed of suicidal ideation or, you know, behavior. Mm -hmm. I mean, one guy from California was ready to end his life, had taken a weapon, a gun, out into the desert and was going to end his life. And that's Mm -hmm. when Ray's showed up. And he says he had missing time, but when he woke up, he no longer felt suicidal. Mm. Got a number of cases like this. The worst I hear in terms of after effects is people will report like some scars, which heal up quickly. I don't think that's super negative. No. It's it's, it's how people interpret it. Because there's a, a number of people who just feel like, hey, I don't understand what's going on, and this frightens me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I guess most people are very grateful. People that are in severe pain and, you know, chronic pain and 
and you know on deathbed sometimes and everything um it, it's gratitude and not fear you know it didn't matter how it happened but you see there are going to be people that are always afraid and so you know the old saying an apple a day keeps the doctor away um is there something that a person could do to keep an et doctor away i mean you know do people that are getting healing have a choice um i think so i think if because i do have cases of people who are just no i don't want this contact go away go away go away and put forth that willpower and just communicate with Mm -hmm. their entire being i do not want this now there Mm -hmm. are people who say i don't want this but part of them is saying i i want this (laughs) this is interesting and that will not end contact because we have a tendency to compartmentalize our thoughts. We have a sort of a subconscious that speaks um, quite a bit louder than our actual ego, if you will, mm-hmm. what we're aware of. And this can cause confusion with people because they're like, I didn't ask for this. I'm like, yes, you did. Because we see this in case after case of people who have contact eventually come around and like realize, oh, I did ask for this. But yeah, I mean, if you stay healthy, you're not going to have to deal with this. Uh, Mm -hmm. But I would say, for the most part, a lot more people are being healed than perhaps even realize it. If you talk to medical doctors, they will tell you all about their spontaneous remission stories. And the ETs don't need money or insurance or credit. Mm -hmm. Often they will understand that a person might be better off not having this disrupt their worldview. Mm-hmm. So the encounter will slip by their conscious awareness because they're not ready. Mm-hmm. And also when you were talking about that, I'm thinking about people that live extraordinarily long lives. You know, there are people that are, you know, in the, a centenary now isn't so rare as before. I mean, there's a lot of people that make 100. But there are some that, you know, they're like 108, 110 um, it just made me wonder if maybe they were um, healed at some point and that they could have that longevity. Have you ever heard a uh, story about that or anything? I have, yeah. A number of contactees have told me, first of all, that they've enjoyed extraordinary good health. Mm-hmm. Ones that have illnesses, you know, the doctors will be like, huh, you're doing really well for the number of illnesses you have. Uh, and yeah, I've had a lot of people tell me that they go to the doctor. One guy I interviewed who was caring for his wife, he went to the doctor and he was like 80 or something. Mm-hmm. 70. I, I'd have to look up the exact date, but he's elderly. I'll put it mm-hmm. that way. And okay. I was like, you have the heart of an 18 year old. RD Six Killer Clark had a case where a bicycle racer was taken on board. They put him back. He was faster and stronger. He once started winning every bike race. Uh, it's like health. They give people health upgrades. And here's one case that I think really speaks to what you're talking about here. Mm-hmm. In this case, it's from Jim Law in Gainesville, Florida. And he wasn't happy. He didn't like contact. He's sort of gotten used to it after the number of years. And so one day, <laughs> these grays show up around his bed. And he's like, dude, it's... <laughs> What are you doing? If you're going to take me, why don't you heal this ulcer? Because he was going to have surgery. He wasn't looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, or no, let me see, not an ulcer, hernia, excuse me. Okay. And uh, they said, we know the condition of which you speak and we will repair it. Direct quote. Mm -hmm. And they did. Little handheld instrument, boom, boom, boom. It was done. And he's like, wow, why are you taking me? Why are you taking me? They said, again, direct quote, we are interested in your genetic potential to live a long time. Well, that really rang a bell with him because his grandfather was 106. Mm. Mm -hmm. He had two two aunts who lived past 100. You know, he he had great longevity in his family. Mm -hmm. Wow, is this what they are interested in? This is what they're doing. This is why they're healing people. They are upholding our genetics. This is why people are being taken on board and examined. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because we have genetic problems here on this planet. Our magnetic field is failing. I learned a lot of this from contactee by the name of Dolly Safran. 
was fully conscious. I wrote a book about her recently called Symmetry. And she was able to fill in a lot of the dots mm. or the blanks or connect the dots, fill the blanks. Uh, she was healed a number of times. And I asked her about this and she's like, that's the main purpose for onboard experiences. And it totally made sense because this is what I was being told from other contactees. Many who do have fear, many mm-hmm. who do have missing time, uh, who have a hard time with it. She got over that long ago. So, yeah, I think that's one of the reasons they are here. And isn't it interesting, Marla, that our the human race, the longevity has just about doubled in, what, the past couple hundred years? Yeah, like 35 was a killer but way back when. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? That no. makes me wonder. Well, yeah. I mean, there, there's a lot of wonder in this whole, whole situation. Um, but let me tell everybody that there's some really interesting, again, well, all the accounts in the book are interesting, but he's got the book broken down into four parts. There's healing of injuries, healing of minor illnesses and ailments, um, healing of serious illnesses and diseases, and then beyond UFO healing. So, I mean, you know, it, it's just not like one thing we're talking about. We're talk- jumping around and talking about all different things, and um, yeah, it, it's going to take me a long time to get through the book completely. But um, one of the things, um, you, they also do healings on animals. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, this was so encouraging <laughs> to uh, to see because I really did not expect it. Uh, but mm-hmm. absolutely, I found like a dozen cases. And it was really extraordinary. I mean, there was a case from England involving a gentleman who had a horse who was suffering from some hoof rot or something wrong mm-hmm. with hooves. Mm-hmm. And he saw light coming from the stables. And so he goes in there. This is around 1960. Mm-hmm. And inside was this very strange looking fella. And he was holding this weird looking machine, which almost looked like a dental x ray device. Kind of had two sides to it, two arms projecting with metallic spheres, kind of. Mm-hmm. And he said, I'm healing the horse. I, I, I'm healing your horse and did. And he actually watched it happen, watched as this being moved its instrument along the mare's forelegs, focusing mm-hmm. on the hooves. Hmm. And that's one case, but there's quite a few. There was another one from Australia where a gentleman, his dog was healed, uh, which I found very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, a mantis type being who healed his pet dog, Sam from arthritis crippling arthritis wow got a number of cases of dog healing one lady i interviewed personally her dog caught valley fever that's Mm. a a fungal infection and she was taken on board she saw her dog being examined she panicked went running towards them and they confronted her like stop we're healing your dog calm down wow so yeah i mean there's cases one of the cases actually from Dolly Saffron, who I just mentioned. She's a zookeeper. Mm. Um, it's so interesting because contactees, as a rule, almost have this amazing connection with animals. Mm-hmm. It's extraordinary animal stories. I now ask that anytime I interview someone. Like, I don't suppose you have any interesting animal stories. <laughs> <laughs> they go crazy. Like, oh, I do, I do. I, how did you know? Because this is a thing. And Dolly, as a zookeeper, she had this little cute gibbon. Just, I think she was very young. Mm-hmm. Just a baby gibbon named Sarah, who was mm-hmm. diagnosed with leukemia. Oh. It's not expected to survive. Uh-huh. And Dolly, being a fully conscious contactee, reached out telepathically and said, please, I just cannot bear to see this sweet little monkey or primate you know, go through this. Can't you do something? And they did. No, yeah. Sorry, short. Sarah, the little gibbon, uh, is an adult and doing great. <laughs> so, yeah, case after case of different animals, dogs. Uh, one lady, she was cured of arthritis. Her dog came on board with her, and they cured him too. Oh, see? They like animals. This is a good thing. Um, a question popped in a head, into my head again. Um, so, people are talking about. Um, 
like the Field of Dreams movie. You know, if you build it, they will come. Yeah. Now, can people that are listening and, you know, maybe are having really bad um, physical maladies and stuff, and I've heard something like that, that somebody said, if you call on <laughs> an extraterrestrial, they will come. Is that true? It has happened. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I get contacted constantly from people like, bring me the aliens, you know, call the aliens down for me. Gosh, yeah, I wish yeah. I could. And I put in the front <laughs> of the book, please understand that I don't have that ability. Mm-hmm. And I do, I mean, there are many avenues to healing. I yeah. really recommend, you know, meditation and exercise, communing with nature, uh, you know, diet, getting plenty mm-hmm. of sleep. Learn meditation and out-of-body experiences. I found 20 cases of people healed using astral projection. Ah, This yeah. is something you can do and put in your own hands. Right. That said, there are some cases where people have reached out for healing. And here's one that's just so touching and weirdly funny in a way. Mm. Uh, was this lady who was suffering from chronic renal or, let me see, renal failure. Uh-huh. And couldn't go to the bathroom and finally went to the doctor and he was absolutely horrified. He's like, you are having complete renal collapse. You know, you need to go to the emergency room. This is bad. You're going, Mm -hmm. you know, what do they call it? Where they purify your blood? Yeah. um, Dialysis. Dialysis. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) you. Um, So she's. Like, oh, no, <laughs> goes home to inform her family and, and tells mm-hmm. her boss, you know, I'm not coming in. I've got renal failure. Please pray for me. Mm-hmm. Told her friends, pray for me. This is bad. I have to go to the emergency room. Called mm-hmm. her family. This is what's happening. And falls asleep, right, <laughs> on her bed to mm-hmm. wake up to find these short little brown-skinned figures, not grays or anything I've ever heard of really before, just humanoids. Mm-hmm. are massaging her on her abdomen. This is what she perceived. She was kind of going in and out. Mm-hmm. And woke up the next morning and went to the bathroom. And she's like, huh, <laughs> this is good. Went to mm-hmm. the doctor, and he's like, well, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, what happened? And she's like, I, angels, I think angels came. Mm-hmm. And he's like, well, you know, maybe I misdiagnosed you. I don't know what to say, but you're fine. And so she told everyone, I think angels came, even though she's like, these were little brown skinned short beings. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was a month or two months later, she she found herself on board a craft. I mean, there's no doubt. She was on a table, the round room, all the details we hear. Mm -hmm. Held up this instrument I've heard described over and over. It's this flat little sort of metallic device that curves around your torso. And it projects your inner organs in full holographic live color (laughs) and they put it over her kidneys they said look these are your kidneys and they looked all pink and healthy and they said they look fine don't they and she's like yes they do and they adjusted it and they said this is your liver do you see all these dark spots and she's like yes and they said your liver is unhealthy you need to stop drinking diet coke (laughs) (laughs) Aspartame. (laughs) Which, you know, is so interesting to me because they they do give people dietary advice. They told one lady, you're eating too much fatty foods. You're getting fat. You need to stop. They Mm -hmm. told Dr. Sparks, you're eating way too much meat. It's clogging (laughs) up your digestive system. They told another guy, you need to stop smoking marijuana. This is not the life we had planned for you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so, what they're planning people's lives <laughs> wow. yeah that that's interesting yeah <laughs> but yeah they give dietary advice people have asked for a healing and it has happened i would say five percent though uh it's not super common maybe ten percent mm-hmm. i don't advise people necessarily to depend on that mm-hmm. but you never there's always hope true healing honestly comes from within yeah and ets in some cases are just opening up those pathways, those energetic pathways that allow healing to take place. Mm-hmm. So, that yeah. was response to that question. It does happen, but I wouldn't rely on it. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and, you know, I think, I mean, not all ETs are benevolent. 
you know, like there's all humans are not all benevolent. So, yeah, you better not fool around because you might just get the wrong person. Or I, I wouldn't worry about that so much. I no. honestly don't think. I mean, there's a lot of disinformation. There's a lot of flat out yeah. lies in this field. Mm-hmm. Honestly, there's a lot of fear. So someone, I've talked to people who've had the same exact encounter in detail. Mm-hmm. And one's like, this was evil. These are the bad guys. Mm. And I was like, well, you know, I rather enjoyed myself. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the problem. These ETs are very advanced. We mm-hmm. are very fearful. Mm-hmm. We look at them through the lens of our culture, which is rife with mm-hmm. trauma and fear and murder and war and just horrific things we do to each other. Mm-hmm. So someone comes into your room and they look a little different. Mm-hmm. You have an automatic panic response. Yeah. Very worst I hear is being physically examined. Honest mm-hmm. to God. You know, that that's the worst I hear. There aren't accounts, certainly not in my files, of sadism or torture or yeah. anything like that. So, no, I wouldn't worry about the, quote, bad guys. Okay. I'm not going to say there's not bad ETs out there because look at us. Right, yeah. Exactly. We don't have the ability to travel interstellar distances, and I honestly think you know, any bad beings out there aren't at that level. Mm-hmm. So once you reach a level of technology that allows you to travel interstellar distances, you long ago reached the ethical level, the moral level, mm-hmm. the spiritual level, the psychic level, that you're not harming each other because remember they're all telepathic they know exactly what's going on i have no yeah. accounts of wars warring uh-huh. ETs or anything like that <laughs> you have to be very careful i encourage people and i can't underline this enough look at the first hand cases you tell me you know where's the torture i don't see it et's coming down and beating people up and just horrifying things mm-hmm. with each other yeah we can do that to our own selves and you know we do um <laughs> We have to get ready to go. Um, so before we do, um, tell everybody where they can find your website and more information on you. Yeah, thanks, Marla. I do have a website, PrestonDennett.Weebly.com. So if you just punch my name, you could probably find it into the Internet. And you can certainly find it on my Facebook page and Twitter. And I'm on Instagram. I do have a YouTube channel. I'm putting out my research for those who you know don't have the time or desire to read a 500-page book. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, that was the hardest book to write. Oh, my gosh. Well, it's a good one, for <laughs> sure. I appreciate that. But, yeah, thanks for having me on the show. It's awesome. Well, thanks for being here. Come back again, and maybe we won't take it so long in between. And let's t- uh, thank everybody for listening in as well. And until next time, everybody, blessed be and merry meet again. Good night. This has been another edition of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Be sure to tune in next week at the same time for another great guest and more fun. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2009. You have been listening to the Para-X Radio Network. 